For the live today, we are talking about how to start a podcast. And if you ever, ever wanted to start a podcast, which you probably might have thought about it during coronavirus, um, who knows? Uh, I have a very special guest today, uh, my friend, uh, Sapel Chanel Mish, who is the founder and director of Written and Record. Recorded, sorry, uh, which is a content marketing agency and she's also a podcasting expert. So if you've got any questions, please put it in the chat as well and we'll answer it for you. Uh, but today we're going to go through so much and I'm really excited to have you. Welcome. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for coming and, and jumping on this. Uh, well, it's, it's raining here. I was going to say it was a rainy day, but you're in Melbourne, so it's, it's probably different. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, it's actually sunny here. Can you believe it? We've ah, we've swapped roles. We've swapped. Yeah, it's like terrible and raining here. But um, no, let's not talk about the weather because that's too cliche. We're talking about podcasting. Um, <laughs> so for those, I mean, I feel like I know you quite well. But for those who have never met you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're working on. So I run a content creation agency, as you said, a, a content marketing agency. So we specialize in podcast production, SEO optimized copywriting and training workshops. So we teach people public presentation skills, how to write well and how to create their own podcast series. So that's the three things that we do. And I came to this point in my career by working in mainstream media for over 20 years. So I've worked in radio, I've worked in television, I've worked online. I started off back in the day when, you know, newspapers actually sold and they were a thing. So that's that's where I started. And audio has been a lifelong passion and journey of mine. I actually started in audio when I was 14 years old. Uh, I used to present a radio program with my dear dad, a bilingual program. And wow. uh, he was hosting and he said to me, would you like to come and join me and do all the English bits? And so I started writing all the ads for him and then translating all the sections in Turkish into English. And then suddenly I became his co-host. Wow, that's 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 really cute. Like, so you must have got all this um, from your dad. So it's kind of genetic. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's genetic, but there is this passion well, for audio. <laughs> Dad used yeah. to sort of tinker in the garage when, you know, when I was little and he'd always have this short um, wave radio on all the time. And I would be fascinated at the stories that came out of this little box and how it could sort of captivate my imagination. It was like real theatre of the mind. And that sort of passion started very young, um, from a very young age. And then I was fortunate enough to do the program with Dad and then actually launch into community radio from there. And community ra radio is such a great training ground in audio. You can make all of the mistakes. Um, and I just sort of carried that into into my professional career and I've worked all around the country and internationally as well. I mean, one of my earliest jobs was working on a FM station where, you, you know, you did sort of rock song requests and um, I was getting phone calls from miners from all over Western Australia asking me to play another Akadaka or, a, you know, another track from one of those old school rock groups. and. And that's sort of how I learnt how to craft programs and, and it, that's how I've ended up with podcasting. Wow, that's that's such a beautiful story. Like you're, it's, it started from your upbringing and dad really fostering that uh, and nurturing that talent and here you are today. So t tell us about podcasting because from, from my view, I feel as though, so it's kind of like a book, right? Everyone feels as though there's a book in them. They should write a book. And then podcasting is now this kind of book. Uh, do you think everyone should podcast? What you, what's your views on that? I actually absolutely don't think everyone should podcast because we are living in a world where we're inundated with content. And if you're not creating content that is actually meaningful, engaging, add something good into the world, you're purely partaking in an ego exercise. Whether you're an individual or a brand, you really need to think about why are you creating this content piece and what purpose is it going to serve? How am I going to 
get people to invest in this journey with me and what value am I going to give them to them so you know those books you used to read when you were little or you know later on that stay with you forever it's because they gave you something that you learnt or they gave you some entertainment value that they actually gave you something that stayed with you they emotionally changed you they shifted your thinking they challenged you they broadened your horizons if a podcast can't do that it's purely an ego exercise so I absolutely don't think everyone should podcast it's a huge commitment to podcast where you're providing all those elements where you are providing that connection where you are providing a different perspective and value and education and entertainment you need to craft a piece of content that ticks all those boxes and you're right. And I've worked with brands in the past where they're like, oh, yeah, let's just um, throw one together. And while we were recording the audio, I just found it so much harder because you, people don't see you. So then you have to be a lot more animated in your voice. And it actually uses a lot of energy. And I think people don't realise, I don't know what's your thoughts, but people don't realise the the amount of um, more work you have to do because it's audio. Um yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work and I call it the theatre of the mind. So you need to be able to paint pictures and that could be either through your narrative, the way that you mix the audio, it could be in your storytelling process, in your interviewing technique, but you need to be able to take people on this journey where they can visualise. It's the same with a book, all the great books paint pictures in our minds and we create the heroes and heroines of the book. Audio has that same sort of emotional uh, appeal and strength. But if you don't do it well, you won't get that level of engagement. Yeah, that's right. So what are the podcasting trends these days? Like what are people listening to? Um, true crime is always a hot ticket item. For some reason, people love listening to true crime. That's I don't think that's ever going to go away. Uh, we're sort of fascinated. It's a bit like looking at a car crash, right? You know, yeah. you don't want to look, but you want to look. You, you don't want to hear the gory details, but you do want to hear the gory details. I think that's the allure of, of true crime podcasts. Um, daily news podcasts have become quite popular as well. And, um, you know, in the current environment that we're living in, that actually makes a lot of sense because there, there's been a lot of sort of mistrust around certain media outlets and you know we've heard that term fake news a lot bandied yeah. around and so thanks to Trump. people want it yeah people want to be able to um hear different opinions and diverse voices and um and you know podcasting one way to be able to to do that yeah, that's right. And I, I agree with you as well. I'm, I have a mistrust in media at the moment because mainstream media is, is all the same. <laughs> like how they've reported Black Lives Matters recently, they're all the same types of people. Like you need people with lived experience to report on Black Lives Matters. So anyway, that's a, that's a huge, huge topic for another day. Um, but speaking, you, you mentioned interviewing before and how, how important is interviewing skills in a podcast? Interviewing skills are crucial in a podcast. It can like sort of literally make or break a podcast um, if you don't follow a particular structure so interview good all good interviews start with research yeah. they start with planning and research so you really need to know in detail who you're talking to and why you're talking to them and then have a structure in mind of what what do you want to cover in this particular episode and structure your questions in a logical narrative way so that it's not sort of like you're rambling all over the place and once you do that, uh, you've got your sort of roadmap to carry you through the episode. But what you need to do also is to treat it as a bit of a discovery. So don't uh, rigidly stick to your questions. That That's the worst interview style when you're not really listening intently. It, it's a real key skill to uh, 
be able to listen intently to someone, pick up on something that they have said to you that you weren't anticipating and then roll that into a new question. And the example that I like to give is, um, so when I was at WAPA years and years ago, our lecturer told us a story about how the opposition leader at the time, who was John Cusin, had just told a journalist that morning that he just resigned. And he gave him a scoop. He had told no other journalist. And the journalist sort of looked at his notepad and went, um, so anyway, let me tell you, <laughs> ask you about this, this policy question. And John Hewson said to him, like, are you, are you stupid? I've just given you the scoop of the day, the new story of the day, and you've completely ignored what I've just said to you. Let's just say I think that that journalist moved on to another career and, you know, John Hewson wasn't very happy that day. But that is a prime example of how an interview can go wrong if you're not intently listening to the, the person that you're interviewing. So listening is really important. And then the way you ask questions are really important. Often when people aren't skilled interviewers, they ask closed questions. And when you ask closed questions, you're limiting it to the person just answering in a yes or no way. Whereas if you ask open questions, like how did you come to that conclusion? Why did you do that? You know, who helped you with that? Then they go into storytelling mode. So it's about helping that person go into storytelling mode because not everyone's a easy communicator uh, or a natural storyteller so that they they do need a hand sometimes the other mistake a lot of people make is because they do a lot of research they want to prove how smart they are or how well they know this particular topic so they are ask questions in a way where it's like the question's never going to end they're trying to demonstrate how how much they know about the particular topic you have to remember you're not the center of the story. The person that you're interviewing is the center of the story. So take a step back, stop, stop trying to prove how smart you are and ask really pithy, succinct questions and get to the point mm. and then drive the story forward. Uh, and don't ask, you would have heard this, Kathy. often people ask a question and then another question and it's sort of like, well, which one should I be answering? Um, oh, yeah, it can so, get really confusing. It's like, what? what? Yeah. Yeah, so that's their sort of, and then the other one that sort of bugs me is when people do interviews about things that they're not passionate about, and that shows. You, you can hear in their voice that they don't really care about this topic. So if you're not invested in that topic and if you're not passionate about it, why should the audience care? That's So right. you're asking people to invest time, but you you kind of like, a little bit half-hearted about it and that will show particularly with voice because there's no other cues and your voice will give you away yeah that's right I I have actually seen that recently with the whole again I'm going to use the whole Black Lives Matters movement because a lot of people have seen oh yeah hashtag Black Lives Matters it's trending they want to get involved but when you actually listen to them and some of the, the things that they say, it's like, well, you don't care. You're not a true ally. So yeah. anyway, again, <laughs> another topic. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's topical and it's, it's true. People will sniff out or, uh, if you're not authentic. That's Correct. what I say. So, mm. so people will hear in your voice and in the way you're delivering whether you're actually performing or whether you really do care about this particular topic. Um, and the voice is a dead giveaway. Yes, yes. So how can people develop interviewing skills? It's practice. It's going through those things that I've just discussed and making sure that when you're sitting down to do an interview that they're top of mind, checking your questions to see if the set questions that you've got are open questions listening really well to the person that you're interviewing and then also paraphrasing um, something that they may have said. So picking up saying, oh, look, earlier on you said X, Y and Z. I just like to drill down a bit further on that particular issue and you can sort of um, unpick a topic further by using these sorts of techniques but at the end of the day 
the person's only going to get better at interviewing by practicing and doing it more often with people and you can start with people that you know and that you feel comfortable with so don't go and try and interview a celebrity or someone prominent as your first interview and then scar yourself for life because it made you so nervous and you got such a bad outcome that you don't want to go down that path again i mean it can be a break of make point for some people. I tell you early on in my career, I interviewed a musician, I won't name her, <laughs> and she literally ripped shreds off me in that interview. And that could have been a breaking moment for me. I could have thought, oh gosh, I don't I don't have what it takes to to do interviews. Whereas I just put it down to her prickly personality and thought, no. I, I did all of the, the right work. I went through all of the, the issues that we discussed, but she just had a prickly personality. That was a learning curve for me because not everyone that you interview is going to be nice. They are going to be challenging. So you need to be able to have thick skin when you're doing interviews that when you don't get the right reaction or when you don't get the anticipated reaction that you can keep moving the interview forward. That's a really interesting point because I think a lot of interview, like a lot of people assume that, oh yeah, it has to be a really nice conversational interview. But what if you're tackling an uncomfortable issue like racism or something like that? It's it's going to be really uncomfortable and it might be really emotional. So some of the things uh, you ask or things that I've spoken about will be quite triggering. So I think that's an important point to to really be prepared for the unexpected. Um. Yeah, and that's that the unexpected is where the magic happens. And I yes. think some of the best interviews are where there's tension. Because when, when you've got two people gushing over each other, it can get quite boring if it they're gushing boring. for half mm. an hour. Yeah. Oh, I love your dress. Oh, low lipstick. <laughs> that's like, that's yeah. right. But, but <laughs> it's like, okay, well, we've not really achieved anything. Mm. We haven't actually got to the nub of a particular topic. Whereas if there's a little bit of tension, if you're challenging someone about a particular topic, then it's a learning opportunity for the people involved in that interchange, but also for the audience listening, because they've got a lot of questions as well as they're listening to that exchange between two people. And, you know, the 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 conversation around Black Lives Matter is a perfect uh, example of that, because there is a lot of tension around that topic. Uh, you know, if you ask some Australians, is there racism in Australia, they will emphatically just say, didn't say no. Absolutely no, we are not a racist country. Whereas if you ask another group of Australians, they will say, absolutely, yes, it's my daily lived experience. So it does come down to lived experience. So imagine now if you had two of those people in the same room um, picking this topic and how it impacts us as a nation and how we talk about these topics, that level of different lived experience is going to give such a good listening experience to the audience because it's going to give you that level of tension that's respectful but you're going down a discovery path together between two people to see the world through differing points of view. Yes that's right and I agree with you and it's I would watch that like I wouldn't watch something where it's just um, like we were the, the earlier point about complimenting each other's clothes and everything like that. Uh, so speaking of questions, let me just check if anyone has any questions. Okay, so we've got a question from Courtney and she asks, do you recommend sharing the interview roadmap with the person being interviewed beforehand? What's your views on that? I actually don't. And this is years and years of radio training. And I'll tell you why I don't recommend sharing interview questions is because people often panic over prepare and because they've spent so much time preparing they want to tell you every single thing that they've written down and that takes out the sucks out the oxygen from that interview because they just want to read out all the answers oh. that they've got so it, it takes away the spontaneity it takes away the energy and it takes away that sort of unexpected element uh, because they've spent so much time 
crafting their answers, that they just want to be able to deliver all of that. And it just sounds wooden and robotic. So I would give them what I call broad brush strokes. So you give them a guide. These are the types of questions that I want to ask you. These are the types of topics I want to cover, but not verbatim the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think we've got another question here. Uh, what tips do you have for podcasts without an interviewee? So if they're a solo speaker or just topic-based? Oh, gosh. This is... You can interview yourself, gonna... right? Put a mirror in front of you. <laughs> no, just joking. Just joking. <laughs> it, this, is, this is a trend that I really dislike. Sorry to be harsh. I just don't think that what you have got to say is so profound that you can just record your stream of consciousness, upload it and share it with people. I just don't think that it's a good way to make content. I think content needs to be interactive, challenging, have different storytelling elements. If it's just one person just telling you their opinion, it doesn't have any of those things that we talked about. It doesn't have the tension. It doesn't have the diverse perspective. It doesn't have the storytelling element. Unless you craft it like a short story. So I give it a proviso. So unless you have actually taken the time to really research a topic and craft it like a short story and deliver it like that and be able to paint pictures. But if you're just, I'm an expert, I'm just going to talk for 15 minutes and upload it, do no editing, do no finessing and structuring and moulding, I, I just think that's a waste of everybody's time. Mm. And I also think maybe we could we should look at what the intent of that content piece is, is podcast uh, appropriate or should it be a video vlog style or an article um, and I, I agree with you because it's very rare that people do solo podcasts I think the only person I can think of that does it really well is probably Seth Godden but that's about it yeah he's like one of those yeah. rare special people on our earth <laughs> I agree with that. And it's like the, the way he writes his little blogs as well. They're, they're very short. short. They, yeah. yeah, it's usually like two paragraphs. Sometimes they're one sentence depending on his mood, you know. Mm. Um, but they are always enlightening. And that's not to say that there aren't people out there like him or people out there who can't be like him because we tend to put some people up on a pedestal and say, no, no, only he or she can do that and you can't do that. But that takes years of practice and years of fine-tuning your craft to be able to get to that level. Whereas if you're just starting out and you think, oh, yes, I've got all these gems of wisdom to share and I'll just record them, I think you're doing yourself and other people a disservice. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for that. Thanks for answering those questions. And I don't think we have any more questions, but keep them coming, guys. Great questions. All right, yeah, so questions. yeah, yeah. All right, so now to actually creating that podcast itself. And we had a conversation earlier um, the other day in which there's different levels of production. Like you could do it yourself, you could outsource it. What are some of the, I guess, levels that you know and the pros and cons between each of them? So it depends, again, who you're trying to reach, what your purpose is. The, the levels of production are pretty much you could DIY it or you could bring in a professional to look at the editorial and test technical aspects for you. But DIYing it doesn't mean that you do something of less quality because if you don't invest in the quality, you're not going to get the engagement. And I'll give you an example. Um, often... A lot of podcasts out there only get about 144 listens. That's what the t stats are telling us. That's not a lot of people listening. That's really low levels of engagement. All those kick-ass podcasts out there that get really high levels of engagement, thousands of listens or millions of listens, are the ones where they have invested the time into the storytelling, the technical production, the post-production, so they've 
put in a lot of effort into who they're interviewing, how they're doing the interview, where they're doing the interview, and how they're splicing and, and dicing it at, at the end. Now, you can do something that's high quality as a solo operator, but you need to be able to learn the things that we discussed, like the art of the interview. You need to be able to learn how to use the tech to be able to record really high quality audio. The benchmark's really high now in the podcasting space. We've got over a million podcasts. So if you want to get any traction, you need to start off with the baseline of it needs to be quality. So that means investing in training. So you need to learn how to not only do the technical aspect of the training, but the editorial aspect of the training uh, to learn how to, to tell a story uh, like a journalist would. And then you need to be able to train in the post-production side of things. So once you've got everything together, soundscaping it all so it sounds beautifully and, and it, everything sort of meshes beautifully together. So that's a lot of time that you need to invest in training and also getting the right equipment because if you don't purchase the right equipment, you're not going to sound that crash hot. I mean, no matter how many times people can say, oh, look, you can just record into your iPhone or, oh, look, people don't expect quality these days because it's all about authenticity. <laughs> I just, I call BS on that. <laughs> <laughs> it, everything has to be quality because... They don't see I you. Mean, well, yeah, so they... What's that? Uh, so they can't, because they can't see you, that it has to be high quality. Otherwise, That's they'll right. get distracted by, let's just say, the dog barking or the... I don't know if you're wearing a bracelet or something like that, the noise of that. So just little things like that. Yeah, and I mean, if you compare it to other content, so podcasts aren't only compare, competing with other podcasts, they're competing with other content too, right? So, you know, there's so much content out there that's really great um, in the the visual world or, the, or in the, the text world. So, it, you know, if you're used to getting really high quality content, say, from a Netflix, um, you, you're not going to hear the background noise that you mentioned, for instance, in Netflix, you're not going to go, oh, what did the actor say? Suddenly the sound cut out. Um, I'm not sure what, what they said at that point. The same principles apply to podcasting. You need to think of yourself as a publisher. You need to think of yourself as a media outlet. If you don't have all of those elements working together, then you're just going to get low levels of engagement. And, and that's an important point because you're not just, it's not just the sound of your voice, but it's all those other mindsets as well, like you said. So what was it again? The media mindset as well. Um, production and yeah, yeah there's storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. That's right. So many different um, layers as well. So how can people learn all those technical elements? Like, is it just, because like when I do a quick Google search, it's just really overwhelming and with so much information, which is why I brought you here today, just to share with us, like, how can we get started? And I think a lot of people would obviously want the easiest or the fastest way, but I guess initially, what can people do? Well, I mean, they can hop onto Google. There's a lot, there's a lot of information out there, which some of it's good, some of it's terrible. Or they can sign up to a course. We provide courses for people so we can actually take them through the, the art of the interview, the storytelling process, the technical aspect, how they set up, how they record, how they edit and how they upload and then distribute. One thing we haven't touched on is the distribution, which is equally important to all of those aspects because if you achieve a really good quality product at the end, a really good series. If you don't tell people that it exists and you don't market it, no one's going to be able to discover it. So you need to also think about the marketing aspect of it as well. It needs to work hand in hand with creating a great content piece, but then telling people that that great content exists. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's the whole treating it as a business really, or as an extension of your own uh, product or service. Uh, and you need that sales and marketing element. Uh, we have, we've got a question. Uh, 
what about what about the editing process? Um, is it quite difficult? Like, what's your? I mean, I guess it really depends on what you're saying, right? Or if you've made a lot of bloopers, well, or if you consciously want to keep those bloopers. Like, what's your views on on that? Not the blooper side, but the editing side. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. it editing's um, not an easy thing, but it's a learnt skill. So um, it's a skill that anyone can learn, and you just get better at it with practice. Um, and the longer you do it, you know, the best audio engineers are the ones that had years and years of experience under their belt. And um, they can hear things that don't sound right. And, you know, you, your ear starts getting tuned to certain things that don't sound right. And it is about taking out the ums and ahs, which can be quite distracting when you're just listening to someone in your ear you don't want to hear them say um and ah multiple times. So if you're in a situation like we're having a webinar right now, you and I have probably said um and ah multiple times and no one's noticed because there's other things that are distracting people like, you know, your plant and the other visual cues, the microphone. And the, Whereas when it's just the voice and they're only concentrating on the voice, they pick up every single thing that they're hearing. And so it's really crucial to take out the ums and ahs. The editing process beyond the sort of fine tuning, finessing, that sort of thing is more about the storytelling aspect too, being quite ruthless. You need to look at a piece that you've recorded and go, no, I've recorded for 40 minutes, but 25 minutes of it was quite boring, but 15 minutes of it was really on point. And pulling out that 15 minutes and turning that into your episode and structuring that into a story, being able to hear what are those storytelling aspects and editing that is a skill that you can learn. Again, you can learn everything, but it takes time to to master that skill and get really good at it. You touched on umming and ahhing before. I'm guilty of that as well, but I get better and better at it. But what's your tips on how to prevent that? It's just to, to um, not um and ah. Yeah. Uh, again, it's practice, but also being comfortable enough not to try and fill every single gap in the conversation. So being comfortable enough to pause and have a think and then continue on, that takes time, that takes practice again. And being conscious of it. Uh, if you're one of these people who tends to um and ah a lot, it might be helpful to put a little post-it note in front of you, for instance, that says um and ah as a reminder. And I tell you, this worked for me a treat. When I first started out in the media, I used to do this review section. I'd, I'd review movies um, every morning for the breakfast program. And I had this crutch. Everyone has a crutch. My crutch was to say absolutely. It was almost like my full stop, my punctuation. And one of the listeners rang in one morning and said to the producer, would you stop, tell that woman to stop saying absolutely? It's irritating. <laughs> and so I put down absolutely on a post-it note in front of me every morning when I went into the studio. And that was a cue for me to not say absolutely. So it was a visual reminder. So you can do these little tricks to trick your brain to not do the thing that you continuously do as your crutch. That's, that's really good advice. Some people have said also to stick your tongue up the roof of your mouth if you feel like you want to say it. <laughs> or to your earlier point as well, pause, because again, it's practice, but pausing can be really effective. So great advice there. All right. Uh, let me just check if we've got any questions. Is there a standard? So we've got one from Ermi. I hope I pronounced your name right. Is there a standard time frame for podcast episodes? So, for example, should they be fifteen minutes max? Like, what's what's the what's the go? There's not a standard time frame, and then that's the beauty with podcasts because when you're doing um, a traditional radio program, for instance, you are constrained by time because you're um, you always have to think about what we call 
top of clock, which is when the news kicks in. So once the news kicks in, you have to end your program. So you've got a, a real time constraint. Podcasts can be anything from two minutes to two hours. But what we do know is that podcasts that hover around what we call that regular commute time frame, sort of 20 to 30 minutes, are the ones that get the most traction because people tend to fit a podcast listening session into sort of uh, activities they're doing in their day. So they might be, you know, on a bus traveling to work or they might be at the gym working out, they might be tending to their garden. So it's usually uh, a around activities that they fit in the podcast. Although coronavirus has changed that a little bit because of a sort of voice assistance, people have been listening just on their desks and at home. So that's changed that behavior a little bit, but traditionally people listen to podcasts when they're doing some form of activity, washing the dishes or whatever. That, that's true because I catch up on all my podcast episodes while I'm commuting and since I've been working from home, I haven't actually been listening to it as often. So that's um, that's a really good point. Uh, we've also got another question um, from Ermi as well. Thanks, Ermi, for the question. Do you have a process for getting listener feedback? So, for example, um, uh, sorry, uh, regarding the content they want to hear more uh, if you're just starting out. So how do you get listener feedback? What's your what's your suggestion? So there's two ways to uh, gauge listener feedback. So you can directly ask for listener feedback. So you can say, um, you know, would would love you to uh, tell us what to cover next episode, or um, what did you love about this particular episode, and directly ask your listeners the questions. The other way to do it is to look at the back end analytics. So when you make a podcast, you upload it to a third party platform. And that third party platform has got back end analytics. So it will tell you information like, where are people listening from? Are more men listening? Are more women listening? How long are they listening for? And one of the cues as to whether you're getting engagement or not is the consumption rate. So that is how long people are listening for. So if you've made a 30 minute podcast, for instance, and you've noticed that people have stopped listening at the three minute mark, it means you haven't you haven't hit a nerve, you haven't made a connection. Uh, and because people aren't feeling compelled to listen to the rest of the podcast. Whereas if you have actually made a piece for 30 minutes and you've noticed that people are listening all the way through or they listen to 27 minutes or 28 minutes, the majority of the way through, it means you're actually creating something that they're really interested in and they're quite happy to spend that amount of time with you. So there's two ways to gauge how well you're doing in terms of listener engagement and interaction. That's, that's really good. Have a look at the analytics because the devil is in the data. <laughs> that's right. Or in the detail, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've also got another question. I love all these questions, um, people. Um, keep them coming. How or where do you go about publishing your podcast on different platforms? So, for example, on Spotify, SoundCloud. So, that's your earlier point about distribution. So, what's your okay. recommendation? So there's um, there's a few different things. First of all, you need to know the difference between a third party platform where you house your podcast, where you upload your podcast and the directories. So there's a few platforms that you can put your podcast on. So in Australia, there's two for companies, for instance, that do it like there's Wooshka and there's Omni Studios, Triton. There's a whole heap of others in the US and the UK, like, you know, Libsyn and Blueberry. So you'll, you'll have to do a bit of research into their price points, what suits your budget, what um, how often you want to publish your podcast and the directories are separate. So the directories, the original directory was Apple podcasts and then Google podcasts have come along. There's Spotify, there's Pocket Cast, there's TuneIn. So they are where you will find podcasts. So for instance, if you've got a iPhone, you might go to Apple Podcasts and listen to your podcast. That's where your directory will sit. Um, I personally really like the way Pocket Casts work and that's my directory of where I 
find my podcast that I like to listen to. But the podcasts that I create for clients sit on a third party platform and we use um, Omni Studios. So you pay a monthly subscription to be able to upload your podcast and then they distribute it across those channels. So you're not individually having to go to each directory and individually having to do that. Omni does that for you automatically. And does it um, stuff up, I mean, the engagement? So I know that, um, well, there's a myth at the moment. So let's just say if you use, uh, this is a bit unrelated, but with social media, third-party platforms, it I've heard that it kind of skews the engagement a little bit. Does using these third-party podcasting platforms skew the engagement or it doesn't make a difference at all? No, they, they track your engagement. So the back-end analytics that I mentioned earlier, you get through those third-party platforms. So you're paying them that subscription fee so they can actually give you all of that vital information about your listenership. So they're doing the heavy lifting for you uh, rather than you having to find those analytics on your own, which, um, yeah, it would be a really... Uh, unwise thing to do when there's these dedicated platforms to house your your podcast oh that's amazing that's really good saves you so much time and, and gives you all the information that you need yeah great I think we've also got another question how often this is from Courtney how often do you think a brand should do a podcast episode how often Yes, so some are like every week, <laughs> some are once a month or once every blue moon. Oh, as in how, how, how often should they release an episode? Okay, I've got you. I thought you meant as in series. Okay, I've got you now. Oh, so, yeah, some people do series as well, like um, season one of this or season two. Yeah. I've noticed that as so, well. So there's no hard and fast rules around it, but it is about consistency again. And you can release a podcast weekly, fortnightly, monthly, it comes down to your why. What is your purpose again? Who are you talking to, your audience? And what do you want them to do once they engage with your podcast? So what do you want them to think and feel and what action do you want them to take? Uh, and what are your key messages that you're trying to get across? So People often think that they need to create a podcast series that goes on and on and on forever. And I, I don't think that that is a wise strategic approach to it. So start off with committing to say something like, my advice is usually six to 12 episodes and then reassess from there in terms of levels of engagement and also in terms of have you got enough content in the content bucket to keep feeding the content beast or have you actually answered all of the questions in this particular area, this particular topic that you're trying to cover, uh, and then you, that's where you end it. You, As a brand, you might create a whole different series on a whole different topic, but maybe this is the end line for that particular topic. It's a bit like a TV show that we all love, we all listen, uh, watch for years and years, but it has to come a time where it ends and it finishes. Like, all the great shows do that. Friends, Think about Seinfeld. Yeah, Friends, Seinfeld. Think about 30 Rock, you know, seven seasons later, it's done. It was gold for seven seasons and it's done. You need to think about podcasting in the same way you're publishing content that's entertaining and educational, but it can't go on forever if it's not serving a purpose and if it's not creating good quality content that is engaging the audience. If you're a brand, like I said, you can create a whole different suite of series on different topics. And, you know, there's lots of opportunities to do that. For instance, if you're a major bank at the moment, you know, a lot of people are feeling financial pains and you might create a series around how Australians are impacted financially. And maybe the first series might look at young families with young children who are renting, for instance, because they're going to have different pains. The second series might look at older Australians who are reaching retirement. So there's ways to kind of have a theme running through a particular topic, but you don't have to continuously try and 
flog something where you've reached an end point. And so I've kind of answered in a long winded way the person's question. My, my suggestion would be going back to the strategy, what's your purpose? And then looking at, okay, this topic need, this topic is hot at the moment. We need to cover this topic weekly, for instance. Uh, and that will be your deciding factor. If it's timeless content, perhaps you only release once a month because that's the commitment required to create good quality content. But what I would say is you need to create the content consistently at the same time. It's about creating a listening habit. It's not about like an appointment. It's not like appointment TV like we used to have back in the day, but it is about creating a listening habit so that the audience expects Kathy to drop her episode on a Wednesday at 12 noon every second week, for instance. Yeah, really, really good point. Um, thank you. Um, we've also got a question from Joe. Do you own all your content that you produce and can you repurpose or reshare it? Do you, uh, mm, could that person clarify as in repurpose yeah. and reshare as in, or you can always repurpose and reshare content. For instance, a podcast can easily be turned into a blog or a feature article. So you can repurpose it that way. You may have recorded a podcast, say, five episodes ago, and five episodes later, there's a related topic that you're covering. So you can cut up, say, two minutes of the podcast from five episodes ago and, and tell your audience, if you remember, we spoke to Kathy about X in episode blah, and she had told us, and you play it and say, and today we're going to unpick that a bit further and look at it from this particular angle. So of course you can splice and dice. And as the content creator, you do own the content. But I think what you have to do perhaps, is you need to make sure if you're interviewing people that you're actually getting permission off those people to be able to use it in different formats. So you have to you have to advise the people that you're interviewing that the content that you're uh, recording and created may be used on social channels. They may be used in, in a feature article or a blog. So you need to um, make sure that you advise them of that if that's your intention. So would that be in a form of a release form or could it just something in writing on an email would be suffice? What's your view? My, my advice would be to actually have a release form, yeah, so that it's um, – a legally binding document so that, you know, five years down the track, the person doesn't come back to you and say, actually, I didn't agree to that. Great advice. I think the original poster perhaps meant if you, oh, okay, she clarified. So when you record your podcast on the host platform, do they have any control over where you repurpose or reshare it? Oh, okay, so perhaps if you are an interviewee, on someone else's podcast, do you own the rights to that or do they own the rights to that? No, so if you're a guest, they own the rights to it. So you've agreed to be a guest and they've probably got you to sign a release form and they can do whatever they want with that content if you've agreed to that, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, no more questions from our listeners. Let me just have a look. All right, so... Maybe we'll just, if there's no more questions, we might wrap this up. How can people reach you for more information? What's the, what's the best way? Well, they can hop on our website, which is writtenandrecorded.com, or they can reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, and I will spell my very convoluted, difficult name. So it's Serpil, S E R. P-I-L, and the surname Chanel Mish, S-E-N-E-L-M-I-S. -E -E uh, you can always drop me an email as well. So it's serpil, S-E-R-P-I-L, at writtenandrecorded.com.au. Yep. Actually, just .com. Great. And for our listeners, we will definitely share Serpil's details. Um, so lastly, last, last question. What podcasts are you listening to at the moment? Oh, gosh, I'm listening to so many. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> no 
no surprises there. I'm not loving all of them because what I like doing is road testing a lot to see what people are doing well and what they're not doing so well. Um, the one that it, it's a you know an old favorite but a really good one 99% invisible absolutely love Roman Mars he can do no wrong in my eyes love it the the one that I discovered uh, probably about six months ago, The Anthropocene, absolutely love it. It's a sort of a storytelling podcast and um, the host reviews things. Uh, one that I've been listening to recently is called The Art of Manliness, which uh, looks at a whole range of different topics, actually. Um, the Art of Manliness, uh, like masculinity? The, uh, um, no, it's... Um, it's it's not about masculinity actually. It's it sort of um, breaks down different topics. Like the last one that I listened to was about the um, how to influence people, the seven um, pillars of influence. So it's uh, I'm not sure where they get their name from. I haven't sort of digged down into where they get their name from, but um, an an absolute old but goodie that I love is um, Death, Sex, and Money with Anna Sale. So as the name suggests, all the issues are about death, sex or money. And they're always really compelling and really engaging. Um, gosh, what else have I been listening to recently? Uh, let me just, I'm just going to grab my phone, Kathy, because <laughs> this, will, um, this will tell you what I've been listening to. If I ever produce a podcast myself, I would, I would be really nervous about asking you to listen to it but yeah at the same time I'll be like I need I need feedback <laughs> <laughs> I would I would be happily give you my advice and, and guidance I love 7am which is an Australian daily news podcast which is quite short and gives you really short analysis of the news of the week um and, uh, you know, you mentioned Black Lives Matters a few times. One of my absolute favourite podcasts is an American one called Code Switch, which looks at race relations and it hits the nerve on really difficult topics. So if you want to be challenged, if you want to get a really deep understanding of race relations, Code Switch is the podcast to listen to. Um, and then other ones that I, I love listening to were kind of ones that are, not ongoing, but um, they've had sort of short series is I loved Dolly Parton's America. Loved, loved, loved. That was a WNYC Studios one. So beautifully recorded and the storytelling was superb. Um, they just captured the energy and heart of Dolly so beautifully. It's really well done. Uh, I love Fresh Air by NPR. Just does a whole range of different sort of topics. Um, I really love the HBR HBR Ideas cast. So if you're trying to get good at you know business and um, get good at leadership and all those sorts of aspects, it sort of gives you really good solid understanding of some of those things that you can get better at. That's a really great one. Really love the Hidden Brain. It's it kind of looks at issues. Um, about you know how our minds work and how we relate to the world around us. It's it's got really great topics that are different all the time, and a, a new one I got into listening is um, home cooking, which uh, came out of coronavirus because in America, people realised that they um, didn't know how to cook because they'd been going and eating out so much. So it, the host decided we better teach America how to cook. So you know it's everything from legumes and beans to whatever you can imagine. Yeah, so I listen to a whole different range of podcasts. It, it is a variety. I, I love it. I love it. And all I haven't heard most of what you mentioned as well, so that's some new content to add to my library. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for your time and hopping on the live show. And um, so for everyone, that was Sapel, and you can contact her on writtenrecorded.com, was it? Dot, just dot com? Yeah. Great. And um, if you would like any content or anything that you would like me to discuss for Keynote Worthy, let me know. Drop me a note and I'll make that happen. So everyone, have a lovely day. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Kathy.